Welcome to another one, another what's on, I guess, our desk at this point. And today we're talking about watches that have finally inched back to their MSRP level. You like to, I like to call it back to life, back to reality, to call notes on I like to call it equilibrium. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And we brought a few toys along with us. So Adrian, we've done a lot of, uh, as of late, market updates, pricing updates. A lot of people are asking, obviously, some specifics. And one of the specifics that you actually brought up this morning when I asked you what do you want to do the video about was, why don't we talk about pieces that have kindly come back down to around that MSRP pr price range, come down to earth, if you will. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be the topic of conversation that all of our customers are more or less interested in, which is why we keep you know, beating this dead horse into talking about these products, because I get the number one question I keep getting asked is, you know, what is a good buy right now? Obviously, it's very hard for us, and we mentioned this many times before, we don't know where the market is going to be, but based on supply, based on demand, and where we really feel the market is going to go, we feel that these type of buys are good. Buys that are close to MSRP, watches that are extremely in demand, that we're bringing significant premiums over retail that are now trading somewhere around MSRP. Walking into any Rolex, say, do you're not getting anything off the shelf yeah, today. Yeah, still, we're still, still at that, we're still at that uh, level. You're walking into AP, Rolex, Richard Mille, Vash, 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 yeah. Vacheron. You're not getting any of that stuff. That stuff is just not there. It's display models only. Right. So by the way, somebody told me that, you know, someone in the Rolex store told them that the watch is a dummy, which is bullshit. It's actually real watches. So there's no movements in them or something? Yeah, yeah it's, right. it's, it's bullshit. There's, those are actual watches. Maybe I guess it was a good, a good excuse I'm to sure give I'm sure people them. still want to buy them anyway. <laughs> exactly. I want to jump. I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the case that you put together, and I'm going to jump into, I guess, what I really like. And why, don't we just, why don't we just talk about the most popular watch just in the world, the Daytona, right? We have a rose gold chocolate Daytona there, there right? Rose gold chocolate Daytona. Obviously, we know Daytona is the most iconic watch of all time. It's still the most in-demand watch of all time in stainless steel. Of course, still impossible to get. And in precious metal. Precious metal allocation of Daytona is very, very difficult. Your AD is not getting a lot. Uh, this is a watch that was trading upwards of $85,000 at the peak. Rose gold chocolate Daytona. 84000 We sold the last one to a dealer at a trade show in Miami. Yeah. Hey, to the wholesale. So this is B2B, wholesale. whereas that person went and sold it to somebody else. So now it is not at retail levels yet. It's still carrying a, a premium, but it's almost the same price as if you were able to walk into Rolex, buy it, pay, pay tax on it. It's still a tax Taxes, shipping, et cetera, so yeah. If you want the watch now, you may be paying a little bit more pending condition, of course, right? right. But for a brand new example like this, you're still paying over MSRP, but, but, you're at, not, a, but, but you're, at a healthy level. But you're not paying $85,000. Exactly. Well, which brings me to the next most popular watch and that's going to be some Mariner or the variation of Oh, this is the Sea Dweller. I know, example. but it's still right. a sub, right? right? We don't have, I don't think you brought a regular sub, but we, we don't, talk, you know we why talk, we don't we, have the regular subs? Because they sell. They're just sure. in and out. The 41, we, we, 126s uh, are just in and out. I had a call for one yesterday, uh, sold literally overnight. Well, if we're talking about Sea Dwellers, let me bring this guy up and let me bring the stainless steel guy up. And this is the James Cameron. Yeah, I mean, very simple. So let's start with the deep sea though. So this is the 116 version, not the 126 version with the, um, look, a pre-owned example like this, and this is probably as good of an example as you're gonna get. It's, it's a pretty recent card right before they switched over to the 126 is actually to be had under MSRP, right? The MSRP today for a 126 Sea Dweller is right around the 12,000 mark. You walk out the store, you're pretty much into the watch for 13.5. These can be had now under MSRP. And what about the two-tone? And the two-tone is hovering right at that MSRP point. Now, the two-tone Sea Dweller, it's a, very, it's a very niche watch, right? Most people, when they reach for the two-tone, they're gonna go for the slimmer case profile Submariner, right? Yeah, they're gonna go for the two-tone. Uh, even though so. I personally prefer the Sea Dweller because of the gold lettering, um, it is a watch that is a bit bulky, but now can be had at retail price. And again, I think another, um, Thing worth mentioning is when you when you're going for a deep sea when you're going for a bigger chunkier watch uh most people want to go with stainless steel simply because i think the two-tone dresses it up a little bit but yet sure. it's still an option to get out there around that msrp price let's talk about something a little uh with a little more juice let's talk about some presidents right so here's a here's a latest example of yeah. a president this is the new model so let, let, let yeah let's take it and i'll take and i'll take this, I'll this take one the, this one's fully stickered and actually sold yeah, um, let's, let's, right. let's let's talk let's talk about one of these guys yeah so here we have the 228 238 uh variants of the uh precious metal day dates we have one of black diamond dial this is not the onyx dial and the champagne diamond dial again uh in my opinion the black diamond dial is my favorite day date 
other than platinum. See, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, I know you've been the champagne dial guy. I'm a champagne dial guy because it's sort of, again, these things being all taped up, you don't really get that. You sort of get the illusion of one big chunk of gold, and I think in a president that's a must. But of course, the upside on this particular piece is that the baguette diamonds really, really pop. They're so the beautiful. Black it's absolutely so beautiful. Which so, one is this? The same one? Same one, yeah. We actually have another one coming in today. I've been buying them up like crazy. Because the reason I'm buying them up is because I feel good when we offer a watch to our client without having to, to crack them over the head. That we know that we can offer value. We can offer a watch that they're well, safe to park their money. Speaking in. of cracking people over the head, and, and I, I guarantee you, as people are listening to somebody's prices they wore and what we sold and where they are now, the very natural question they're probably asking themselves is like, well, so wait a minute, you guys whack people over the head towards the peak of the market. And one of the things I wanted to note is that once certain particular models reached a certain peak in the market, we actually didn't retail any of them. Uh, 99% of the price, uh, 99% of the sales in the last three months leading up to the peak of the market were probably B2B. And the reason for that is because we always stay conscious of the fact that, hey, somebody buys this, odds are they're going to bring it back and they're going to want to trade it in. So we always take two approaches, being super transparent, saying, look, you're buying this at the top of the market. If you really, really want it, go ahead. Uh, but for the most part, like that Daytona was sold for 84000 that was to a dealer. Uh, majority of the stuff at the peak of the market, be it Royal Oaks, restaurants, and things like that, was still sold B2B because we felt that we reached a point that it just got ridiculous. Would you agree? Across like say five, ten models. Look, a lot of a lot of this stuff, you know, even B two B. I mean, if if you look at things that were happening in Asia, B two B, we were selling them for way higher than we were able to sell them retail for here, and they were just moving, like hotcakes. I mean, the, the Asian demand was, was through the roof. So who are we to sell? No, we're not going to. Who are yeah, we to say I, we're listen, not going to sell? It's not. It's not like we committed a crime. It's not like we bought them for thirty thousand and we, we, sold them yeah, for eighty, right? We were paying top dollar at the top of the market, and we were selling for at, sure. A reasonable margin. Well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit on yeah, you, and I'm going to. We mentioned VC again. These two particular models, your overseas, uh, depending on variation, is not a model you're going to walk into your local AD today, you still see it on yeah, the shelves, yeah, or mean, get them. Right, right. And we also have a stainless steel blue dial in there as well. If you want to just pop that out, put them next to. Them. Oh, yeah, there is one. There's a blue dial. So, um, yeah. Again, so the most premium of these still remains the stainless steel blue dial. Right. It's the time. It's time only. In a stainless steel case, one of the still prettiest blue dials. One of the, the prettiest market. blue dials on the market. This was this reached heights of sixty thousand dollars at the peak, and you can pretty much say pending condition. This is a brand new one. It's not halved, but almost halved, right? So if the watch retails for twenty two thousand out the store and you just still can't get it, you have to have a purchase history and purchase something else with it, and then wait in line. You're probably going into. You're probably going to be into this watch more net than if we were to sell it to you today. And that's the key. And I, I'm just gonna clarify the point. A lot, of the, a lot of the times, guys will go out there, they'll get these hot pieces, be it mm -hmm. from AP, VC, Rolex, whatever it might be. But leading up to getting that one hot piece that you're looking for, you throughout time, you end up buying another watch. And what a lot of guys don't end up doing is they don't do their maths properly. I know guys that have collections of 15, 20, 30, even 100 different watches, and they have a spreadsheet that says, okay, well, this was 22,000, this was this. And I always tell them to reprice it because to get this at 22,000, you may have bought a patrimony for 30 grand, which, which, whose real value may be 20 grand. So now really your cost basis on this is not 20 grand, it's 30 grand, right? Yeah. And, and I think this is what you're getting at because this is not close to list, uh, but it's, it just, it's dropped in price. It's, it's, not it's, it's, it's ba base, uh, like you're, if, if you're buying that watch today, brand new onto the market, you're, you're in the plus column more than you were, you were before if you had to buy that patrimony and lose 50%, 40%, whatever the case exactly. may be. So that's why the value proposition let's is talk about Let's there. talk about this guy, because this yeah. is a guy that we personally took a couple of hits on. Uh, we, some, ha we had, I think- na nasty falls. I, yeah, uh, so this guy took a pretty nasty fall all the way down from $125,000 to around with that 70, 75 price right, range, which right. is around MSRP, MSRP plus today. tax, right? Yep. And uh, listen, we took clicks just the same. Uh, you know, uh, with the volume that we did here, uh, especially at the peak of the market, the amount of watches we were simply moving on a daily basis, we got caught with an X amount of inventory that we always had to have in stock. We always had three, four of the blue ones. You guys have seen our unboxings. We always had a few of these. We, always, we had five, six Daytonas in stock at any given time. So again, yeah, of course, it was always, always, uh, we always had to meet the demand of our clients, right? So then we would go out there and look for these VCs because every time we needed it, next time on calls, we'd be 10, 10, 15 percent more. So we were aggressive in our approach, I would say we were proactive in trying to pick up these models before they it's started nice. going Listen, up. And, what, you, and so at, you have a certain it, demand, yeah, you have to yeah, keep what, a certain amount of stock uh, in stock, right? Yeah, so I mean, it we, is what it we, is. We learned our lesson. We kept three, four, five of these overseas in stock, platinum Daytonas, whatever the case may be. But 
I'm gonna go back to watches that didn't take a huge fall, but yet again, sort of fit the theme of being able to buy this in and around that retail price range in mm -hmm. today's market. Look, the two-tone Yacht, the, old, the, old, the older style Yacht Master was never a popular model. Let's start there. Right. Going back to the old platinum bezeled uh, gray, gray dial one, it never really sold well. It always discounted. And obviously with the hype of everything else, it brought up the pricing of a Yacht Master such as this. Now granted, this is probably the prettiest Yacht Master that they made. The rose gold combination two-tone I think is extremely pretty. Yeah, with the black or chocolate dial. Exactly. Uh, where are these at now? So these are hovering at sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars pending condition, and at the peak of the market, these didn't really take that big of a what? correction because they didn't, they, they didn't, they didn't go they, up that side. They didn't, they didn't hit heights of a root beer, right? Yeah. This is this is for for people like said root beer's little brother. Mm -hmm. uh, root beers came from went from thirty five thousand, and and you know they're they're at pending condition around twenty twenty one. That's that's a pretty big fall. Where that's these these guys fall. were trading so around twenty. The, so the highest the highest that. I can remember selling a chocolate one, a one two six reference chocolate was like twenty two thousand at the peak. Right. So and these were around twenty thousand yeah. so dollars. So although they took a hit, they're back to what I like to call equilibrium. Equilibrium. It's I anywhere. don't think I can spell that. Uh, <laughs> let's let's talk about let's talk about this Air King. Yeah, the Air King's a funny one, man. Uh, so this is a one one six. This is not the one two six with the new Crown Guard. Uh, we were selling the <laughs> man. I think we had I think we had prior to the crash probably twenty five pieces. 24. For whatever, we had 24 of them. For whatever reason, we just we just stockpiled Air Kings, right? And they were bringing 12,000 at the peak, and now they can basically be had under MSRP. I think MSRP on is around eight thousand dollars, and a one one. This is a one one six variant could be had under. MSRP now we keep talking. We we keep talking about you know this is where they were, this is where they are, and obviously the one question everybody wants to know is where are we going to be? And I've, I've heard some people saying, oh, you're going to see this stuff selling at 30, 40, 50 off soon, and this, that, and the no, other. No, it's not going to, I, I don't believe it. And I wanted to address that using this thing called common sense, right? So outside of being aware what goes on here internally, and we have a decent volume of sales to be able to provide you actual real data, like the stuff you and Marco did mm -hmm. with specific models. We actually went back in our books, if you guys didn't get a chance to check that out, uh, the articles on the Gray Market uh, Magazine on our website, as well as some of the videos that went out. But we actually went back six years. I went into my accounting software. I pulled out Model X and I said, okay, this is what we bought them for, sold them for, bought them for, sold them for throughout the last six years to be able to come up with that graph. We didn't make that graph up. That came in from our internal sales and only ours. But some will argue, okay, well, maybe that's not enough. Well, there's this thing called common sense. And you guys have to be understand something that we are also very well aware outside of our own sales, outside of our own buying with an agent's department of what goes on in the market in general, i.e. dealer chats with thousands upon thousands of dealers. We see these transactions to an extent, we actually can pull that data and analyze it, just no need to do so, right? Because all day, every day, we're myself, Adrian, Anna, the entire sales team and buying team, they're on the chats all day long and they're seeing what stuff is being offered for, what it's being traded for, what's it actually being sold for. Because when you see somebody says sold on a price of a particular watch, that gives us a much broader understanding of what's going on and it allows us to sort of see what's out in the market. And that's key. Knowing what's out in the secondary market, knowing who has what in stock, especially across major players in the industry. And if you guys think there's thousands upon thousands of thousands of major players out there, they're not. If I had to pick major players on the market, and by major players, I mean those that hold a tremendous stock, I can go region by region and I can literally pick out maybe five top guys in the Middle East, in Asia, in the United States of America, in, in, Europe. South, in Europe, and in South America. And knowing and having that information allows us to, to gauge it and say, look, there's no way in the world uh, this richer meal could ever go down another two, three hundred thousand just based on the amount of stock that's out there. And mind you, these major players are not the guys that are flipping watches out of their backpacks or need to pay their Amex because they just picked this up from mm -hmm. an AD and they really can't afford it, right? These are guys that have the ability to hold that they're stock. They're real operations. Right? They're real operations, much like us, where they hold an X amount of stock and they're able, they can afford to hold it for the market to stabilize. And I think we're exactly where you said, sort of at that equilibrium where the market, and I had this conversation with a client yesterday when he asked me, he said, he said, well, what do you define as a, in today's world, what do you define as that market that's sort of stabilized? And I told him plus minus 20% across everything. And that to me is stabilization. That to me is a normal market where things will trade, again, conditions, uh, how much one bought something for, et cetera, et cetera. That plus minus 20% across the board, I think is a fair assessment to say where we're gonna be here for a while. And no, you're not going to see Baba Watson selling for $100,000 because yeah, those that are holding them, they own them for X. 
It's just not going to happen. It's yeah. and and that's kind of where I'm going. I'm going to I'm going to pick a couple of more before we wrap this up. Here's one that I actually love. Yeah. The Smurf. Yeah. This is the this is the blueberry. The blueberry. Yeah, that's the, the oh, forty-one. Yeah, yeah there's the blue. The black dial. These snakes. Where the Smurf? Yeah, the Smurf. The Smurf is the blue dial. Uh, I actually. On a side note, which one do you like better, the Smurf or the blue? Oh, the bur- uh, yeah, the bur- Burberry, uh, Burberry, for, Burberry. So yeah. I, I like the I like the Smurf because it's it's so it's so unique in its color. For, it's all blue, right? It's all blue. It's, they it's a lighter made blue anything too. Like it before, and it's a forty millimeter, so it fits my wrist a little bit better. We talked about this guy on yeah. the unboxing. I think Champagne it was yesterday Scott, day before. Yep. I again one of those watches until you get it in hand and realize wow, just how good it contrasts good against watch. against the black strap. Watch. And I actually went out and said that I prefer this versus its bracer. Even though I'm the guy to have the big yeah, hunk yeah, of metal I on agree. a sky dweller, it works much better with the Oyster Flex. Let's talk about numbers on these two. Yeah, so look, uh, Blueberry right now, the, the market price is MSRP. And same with the same with the gold sky dwellers on, on Oyster Flex straps. Traditionally, pre-owned watches obviously are going to be cheaper. I feel that today's current market condition, you know, the gap between pre-owned uh, and new. And I say pre owned, I'm not talking about picking an example from 20 years ago that's beat the shit with no boxing papers. I'm t- talking about something close, the right? Spread, the, what, the, the spread, the the spread it, has, got, ha, has, has, has widened. And I think opposite. No, spread, the spread, spread has widened. For you, whatever reason, the spread has widened. Because it used to be like uh, in the hot market, you know, brand new, uh, 10,000, whatever the watch is. And pre owned, that's like within two, three years was what? Yeah, it's just it, it, well, what happens is it, it depends. It depends on the transaction volume. It depends on supply on the market, right? If somebody really needs something, they'll be willing to pay the premium for a pre-owned in, in comparison to his uh, new new counterpart. Today, you really have to give a much better price on a pre-owned. How much product. wider do you think the gap has gotten? Again, it's it's, it's 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 watch per watch basis, but listen, not by not by a humongous margin, but I feel that the margin has has grown a little bit. This oh. is the one I wanted to yeah. talk about. Now, this is a watch that we knew as a dog yeah. when it first came out this was a doggy dog right they came out with the yellow gold which was hot fire it was mm-hmm. a big gold rolex first of its kind everybody went ape shit over it uh, and then they came out with the white gold version of it and nobody wanted it i remember buying this watch for yeah. like seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars, and i couldn't give it away right. where were in the hot market i don't think they saw such a humongous pickup they, they, i mean they, they saw a pickup because everything else saw a pickup, right. but it was still it was still a significant discount off a list. Like they haven't made a white gold one in, in quite so, some time. So was this say, was this the watch that even in the peak of the market was trading on the MSRP? Yes. And yeah, for a white gold, yes. So, so like a yellow gold one, for example, was uh, yellow gold with the new gold Mercedes hands was a sixty thousand dollar watch. MSRP on the watch is right around forty five, forty six when you walk out the door. So it was bringing a hefty premium. White gold, which was the same as MSRP, got actually a little bit more MSRP because white yeah. gold and with a platinum bezel tends to be more expensive. It never really broke 35, 36, 37,000, maybe at the, at the peak. So is this staying where it is or does it's, it also it's, come it's down? Been, it's been pretty stable. So you're telling me stable. that this is the one Rolex that through all the peaks just and kind of flat, it's, flat it stayed line, flat. Yeah. That's actually really surprising because I, I, I honestly can't think of another one that did that. Can you? Uh, from Rolexes? Yeah. Man, even even Cellini's. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm talking. I'm talking about give me. I'm talking about you know, give me another watch I'm such as to, this I'm that throughout the the low, you know, right right when Nothing, Corona started man. to the high peak of last May, that stayed. White gold Yacht Master Two has pretty much been the most consistent watch in terms of market pricing. Is there another? I'm trying to think. I'm saying across other brands, maybe across other brands. I mean, there's there's plenty of product, but if we're, if we're talking Rolex specifically, right, well, because, let's speak, because let's, everything let's finish, in the finish, Rolex let's, ca- catalog went up in price, and let's talk this about is a perfect segue into what I was just saying. Precious metal day days with diamond bezels and diamond dials were never a thing. As of lately, it became a thing, right? It's extremely fashionable. We saw a lot of celebrities starting to wear it, and for the most part, it's just a beautiful watch, right? It's got such, a, such a rich look, right? This was a watch we trade. We this two 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 eight three four nine RBR Pave diamond dial with the diamond bezel. We were trading them for a hundred and ten thousand dollars, and now they're back to equilibrium. Because there's not a lot of these in the store. Oh, the retail is high. What's the, what's the retail on this? I think the retail is around eighty grand. Think about the production numbers that are out there. The question becomes: Is there going to be enough demand behind something like this in order to keep the pricing up? And I think there will be because. Number one, it's a good-looking watch. Number two, people are, it's set in their, in their minds already, starting with the Rainbow Daytona, that these diamond-encrusted, these precious stone-encrusted pieces are collectible. And I will agree with that, because I told you guys before, with Rolex making a million 
watches a year, every year. There's no way you can identify um, any any model in there. Say, oh my God, that's so rare because even the rarest model, to include the Rainbow Daytona, is still being produced in large quantities. Just you're yep. not seeing them because obviously they're being allocated of the who's who. So that stuff is here to stay. I absolutely I agree with that 100. percent I think they're they're also they're also just especially rare in allocation. You know, your average Rolex store is not getting allocated. Okay, they date like this, maybe so. But it's funny, people talk, people think about allocation and the, the first thing they think of is they think about, okay, well, what can I get from my AD? They never think about what, what can the AD actually get? And they right, get pissed at their right. dealer saying, well, why can't I have a uh, Saco? Well, because I will never get one. I'm not a big enough store. Yeah. I don't have the allocation. And I don't they, have the numbers. Yeah, exactly. They need the numbers. They need a certain size. They need to have a certain criteria to fit for, to get a Rainbow Daytona, to get, a, you know, the uh, full baguette <laughs> Skydweller and uh, the Saco, stuff like that. I mean, how many of these does an AD have to sell, you know, in order to get allocated, <laughs> even lot, something yeah. like that, right? So, and again, and this is, I would say, a more recent thing. It's just like the ADs have put the clamps on their retail clients in, in to the ability of them getting certain pieces, Rolex did the same thing to their ADs. You got ADs out there sitting on, you know, a gold mine, have been sitting on a gold mine the last two years, where, you know, uh, a stainless steel Rolex, where their cost is $5,600 or $6,000, they can now sell for 20000 to a guy like me. Can you imagine what kind of a loop all, they were all under the last two years by Rolex themselves? Absolutely. You yeah. know, so, look, guys, Equilibrium is a good word that Adrian chose for the theme of this video. And uh, again, it really boils back down to getting you an, a more, an update that's more often. We used to do market updates every few months because yeah. the market was kind of, you know, there was only so much we could talk about. Oh, this has gone up and this has gone up and this has gone up, right? But now where we reach that equilibrium, and again, in my mind, my definition of equilibrium and somewhat of a stable market is plus minus 20%. I yeah. think this is where we are, and it boils down to the fact that because we specifically wanted to talk about models of MSRP, the two brands or that- Or close to. Or close to yeah. is, is Rolex, indeed, a lot of Rolex. Not surprising, because they make so many different models. Uh, Vacheron, and uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll do another one of these in 30 days. Maybe there will be another brand added to this list. For now, I don't see it. I don't see a, your Richard Mills or your Royal Oaks getting up there. Yeah. The, Royal Oak offshores. Some of the, some of the Royal Absolutely. Oak offshores could definitely fit the steam, and then I think maybe the problem is is that we've sold them all. Exactly because people because people see that hey, you know what? This is no longer sixty thousand dollars. It's right around MSRP. You know what's my downside really? That that's what a lot of people. And I can at. have it today because exactly. you still can't walk into yeah. AP and buy yeah. it. I'm gonna, still I'm still waiting to find the blue one at MSRP that I want to keep. You know the baby so blue the, one. The Golf. The Golf, yes. right? I don't know how you guys came up with the Golf for that one. It's because just, it's the car, the Golf car. I know, but it, there's not enough orange in there. I there's feel like there's enough orange. It's <laughs> right. blue with orange. Guys, I want to thank you for sticking around. Thanks for tuning in once again. Don't forget like, comment, share, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.